to University Library uh, on behalf of our uh, honored guest, uh, Professor H. Uh, James Burks. I will be speaking in English. Uh, we are starting a series, Serendipity in Science, Philosophy and the Arts. Uh, uh, with the event, uh, Nietzsche and uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, I will ask uh, Library the Director Stella Filip Matinovic to say a few words in Serbian. <laughs> Gosti, mi ovdje da vas pozdravim u Univerzitetskoj biblioteci u ovom početku ove serije. Nadam se da će biti zanimljiva svima vama. Interesantno je što se nalazimo upravo u umetničkom centru u kojem je juče otvorena jedna izložba dobitnika politike na nagrade za likovnu umetnost. Tako da možda će iz ove serije predavanja izaći zaista neka interesantna slučajna u susretu filozofije u nekosti i nauke. Nadam se da će Filološki fakultet da nam i dalje druža podršku u ovakvim ciklusima, kao što je do sada bilo. Zvalite mi da vam se obratim u Filološkog fakulteta i da vam prenesem pozdrave dekanke profesora doktora Aleksandre Braneš i profesora doktora prodekana za financije Ljiljane Marković, koje iz opravdenih razloga danas nisu za nama. Filološki fakultet sa izuzetnim ponosom učestvuje u organizaciji ciklusa fenomen slučajnih otkrića na peseku nauke, filozofije i umetnosti, pošto je multidisciplinarnost veoma važna za razvoj filologije danas. Zahvaljujem što ste se u obliku odazvali i daću reč profesoru Bereksu. Before we start with the uh, lecture of Professor Burks, we will um, honor our um, graphic designer who is responsible for all these nice uh, images you will be seeing. Uh, <laughs> and we will see a short movie uh, presenting our catalog, uh, which you can get uh, for free after the lecture. Uh, we have English catalog and Serbian catalog, so please, after the uh, lecture, uh, <coughs> approach me and uh, ask for one. Uh, and you will see the beautiful images now.
Може след това да почусна. many things. And the more I think about serendipity, it appears to me that the world is filled with it. And I have been touched by serendipity myself. One meaning is the unexpected, the unanticipated, pleasant surprise. My life has been filled with unanticipated, pleasant surprises, including the most recent one, tonight. And I'm so happy that uh, you are all here. I was born and raised on a farm in New York. I grew up on a farm. I became aware of life and death, being around plants and animals. So nature was no stranger to me. I, I saw the good aspects and the bad aspects of living in nature. When I finished high school, or I should say before I finished high school, even as a child, I was interested in movies. I think they helped to take my mind away from the boring monotony of farm work, year in, year out, day after day, week after week, milking cows, working in the hay fields, etc., etc. But my mind was not content with this. So I loved movies. My grandmother, a Slavic lady, uh, took me to movies. My parents, one Germanic and one Slavic, took me to films. And I loved going. Some of the early films that I fell in love with were Kovaris, King Kong, Frankenstein, and years later, as a college student, 2001, A Space Odyssey. When I left the farm and went off to college to become a teacher, and later wanting to become a professor, I happened during my fall semester of my first year at college to read a little paperback called The Story of Philosophy by Will Durant. I remember being in my college room, reading it from cover to cover, and when I was finished, I was impressed with two thinkers. Aristotle and Nietzsche. Interestingly enough, they're radically different, although there are similarities. Aristotle presenting a beautiful but fixed and erroneous view of the world. He didn't know it was erroneous. He was not an evolutionist. He didn't know about the concept of evolution, and he didn't accept the ideas that anticipated evolution in pre-Socratic thought. His was a beautiful, eternally fixed world. Nietzsche 
took Darwin seriously and presented a very dynamic view of the universe. A view which stressed three stages concerning our own species. First, the ape. Next, the human species. And in the future, he thought, the overbeing to come. Maintaining that the human being is, is, is as advanced beyond the ape, or were, as the overbeing will be advanced beyond us. We can't even imagine what such a creature would be like. I read Durant's story of philosophy and about Nietzsche in 1959. Almost 10 years later, as a doctorate student under Marvin Farber at the State University of New York at Buffalo, which at that time was the largest philosophy department in the world, I took a visit to New York City and saw 2001 A Space Odyssey a couple of weeks after it opened. I was impressed with it. And of course, the more I thought about it and the more times I saw it, I became more and more impressed with this remarkable film. But more about the film in a minute. As an undergraduate and graduate student, I was impressed with the writings of Charles Darwin. Meeting Darwin's theory of evolution changed my whole view of the world, as it did Nietzsche's. I saw things in terms of process. I took time and change seriously. And of course, the scientific theory of organic evolution challenges us to reflect on the place of humankind within dynamic nature. What is our position in the universe? Darwin, of course, came up with the theory of evolution due to many influences, three in particular. His reading allows the principles of geology and taking time seriously. His voyage on the Beagle itself, particularly in retrospect, his visit to the Galapagos Islands, and later reading Malthus, an essay on the principle of population, which gave to Charles Darwin his concept of natural selection or as Herbert Spencer referred to it, the survival of the fittest. Darwin's worldview in terms of evolution pervades 2001, a space odyssey. So we see Darwin in it, but in particular, Nietzsche. Now, when we watch the film, when we reflect upon this remarkable movie, we realize that we have made a metaphysical encounter with the movie. The movie challenges us to reflect upon the ontological nature of the universe. It presents us with a dynamic cosmology far removed from the fixed circles of Aristotle. It asks us to think about space and time, matter, and energy, and to speculate on the destiny of our species. Because we become aware of a creative universe, creative life, and our own creative species. But yet within all of this creativity, there is underlying it a fundamental unity. When I was growing up, and falling in love with movies, there were three that came to mind when I wrote my first essay for this catalog. Metropolis by Fritz Lang, which gave us a view of the advances in science and technology in a city of the future. And with that human-like robot that dominates the film. So real is the robot that people find it difficult to distinguish between the robot and the real Maria in the film. Things to Come by Alexander Korda. What a remarkable film in its scope. Two human beings at the end are sent around the moon. Although the general public 
stirred up by an unhappy theologian who wants things to remain the same, tries to destroy the spaceship. But the spaceship takes off. And despite plagues and wars, the dream of the scientists are fulfilled when this ship takes off for its journey to the moon. And lastly, for those of you who are interested in Star Trek, my favorite episode is the first one, which many people have never seen, but parts of it were put in a later episode called The Menagerie. The name of the pilot episode, The Cage. It's remarkable. It stars Jeffrey Hunter, is Captain Christopher Pike, who visits another planet and is put in a cage and observed by the extraterrestrials that are superior to him and would be superior to us. Other films more recently that have interested me are Farscape, if you've seen that uh, TV series, particularly number two. Uh, this is uh, where the main character ends up on a planet uh, and, and is, uh, meets extraterrestrials only to learn that he is the alien and not them. And of course, Avatar. Who could forget this film? Which I've seen so many times in IMAX 3D, I'd be embarrassed to tell you how many. But I first saw it in Hawaii, I think three times in, in Hawaii, and then everybody I knew that liked movies, I took to see it with them. So that was my excuse for seeing it so many times. But what a remarkable breakthrough film that was. I looked at it from an anthropological point of view as well as from an evolutionary point of view. Here were, it was a new group of people with a different language, with different values that were being challenged by ruthless capitalists from our own age. Putting all this together and looking at 2001 Space Odyssey, as I've said, we see in it Darwin and Nietzsche. We see Darwin's scientific framework of evolution, we see Nietzsche's philosophical worldview of evolution. And once again, what the film portrays is the evolution of life from fossil apes to our own species to the cosmic overbeings of the future. All right, let's focus in on Nietzsche. What did Nietzsche claim? Well, near the end of the 19th century, Nietzsche claimed that God is dead. He was a visionary. He realized that in terms of advancing science and technology, there would no longer be a need to explain things in terms of a divine being. Not that God lived and died. There never was one. Yet, in a positive way, he opted for the affirmation of life, to say yes to the challenges of life, to overcome your problems. That is, to accept the challenge of overcoming, the challenge of becoming more than you are, a challenge that Dave Bowman meets several times in the film. Nietzsche called for a re-evaluation of all values. In this evolving universe, Values change, too. There are no eternally fixed values, no eternally fixed framework of reference. Thus, he ended up an atheist, but on the positive side, not that there's anything negative about being an atheist, but on the positive side, he advocated naturalism in this dynamic orientation to understanding and appreciating our place in nature. Finally, he developed his own philosophy, having rejected Plato and Aristotle, Kant and Hegel, and being influenced by Schopenhauer, Nietzsche had his own ideas. Three of them, I think, are the most important. Idea number one, the will to power. His philosophy is vitalistic. There is in nature 
this invisible but metaphysical principle which he called the will to power which causes creativity. And so to be in tune with nature, we should what? Create, using our will to power to create something more and to become more than we are. The overbeings of the future, as I said, Nietzsche did not think that our species was the end of evolution on the earth. It's the most recent species, but not the last one. There will be a further evolution of our species in, in uh, collaboration with technology that will produce a superior form of life, which he called der Übermensch, what I call the overbeing, not to confuse it with the fact, with the idea that maybe there could be female overbeings. Well, there could be female overbeings, there could be male overbeings. It's an overbeing. As I said, something so advanced beyond us, we can't imagine it. But Nietzsche knew that something was coming beyond the human species. And that we should create. Now, someone could step back and say, well, if there's no God, why should we bother to create? Why should we bother to be more? And of course, Nietzsche puzzled about this himself. He, you know, why exist if there's no pie in the sky when you die, as we say in English? Well, Nietzsche said, of course, it's in our nature to create. But then he came up one day with an all-encompassing idea. When he was walking by a lake in Switzerland near Sils Maria, one afternoon, he came upon a huge pyramid-shaped rock. I've been there. I took chips from it. <laughs> and suddenly, Nietzsche had the idea of the eternal recurrence of the same. That is, the eternal recurrence of the same universe. This is, in fact, his all-encompassing idea because it made existence, human existence in particular, worthwhile. Why bother to create? Because you will live the same life an infinite number of times. So act as if your act has eternal value because it does. Now, with these three ideas in mind, the will to power, over beings in the future, and the eternal recurrence of the same, let's take a look at 2001, A Space Odyssey. First of all, it is the pro product of two geniuses. Stanley Kubrick, the brilliant movie director, producer, knew about Arthur, Sir Arthur C. Clarke and asked him to collabor collaborate with him because Cooper wanted to produce a great, perhaps the greatest, and indeed the greatest science fiction film of all time. So Cooper and Clarke collabor collaborated <coughs> on this project, which took at least four years from the idea that Cooper had to the finished film. Stanley Kubrick had the idea. <clears throat> Arthur C. Clarke had the reputation as a great science fiction writer, and he had written a short story called The Sentinel. It's a wonderful short story. So Clarke thought, well, I will expand my short story, The Sentinel, into a film-length screenplay working with Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick was very clever. A novel would be produced from this film by Clark, but Kubrick and Clark did the screenplay. When Clark kept sending copies of the novel for Kubrick's opinion, Kubrick would write back, you need to improve this, you need to improve that. But as I write in my essay, it was all contrived. Cooper did not want Clark's science fiction book published before the film was released. And it wasn't published until, until after the film premiered in New York City in the spring of 1968. 
The film is cosmic and evolutionary in its perspective. It presents a new perspective on our place in the universe that neither Darwin nor Nietzsche could have imagined about a hundred years ago. <clears throat> neither Darwin nor Nietzsche ever thought that our species could leave planet Earth. They never seriously thought about extraterrestrial beings, although once during the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin did write in his diary that it would be wonderful to see the vegetation on another planet. He wrote that while he was in the Brazilian rainforest. If we take a look at the film, it occurs to me that besides Nietzsche, there is one other philosopher that should be mentioned. The Italian thinker, the brilliant thinker, Giordano Bruno. Now during the Italian Renaissance, Bruno was bold enough to criticize the church and state, but he had his own ideas. Bruno claimed that space is infinite, time is eternal, and it's a dynamic worldview that we live in, a world that is open-ended to new possibilities and probabilities and actualities. As I write in my essay, Bruno would be pleased, probably exhilarated, but if he ever had had a chance to watch 2001 A Space Odyssey, he would have felt right at home in the film, watching the film. One other scientist that I should mention is Albert Einstein, the father of the scientific theory of general and special relativity. And in the film, we see sequences where time is relative, where frames of reference are relative. So you have this cosmic perspective, this evolutionary framework, and pervading it all, relativity. Now, in the film, there is the Darwinian struggle to survive and to become more. It's personified in the struggle between Dave Bowman, our hero, and Hal, the neurotic, if not psychotic, intelligent computer. I wrote down here, the creative superior individual wins over the challenge of technology in general and the challenge of Hal in particular. I found this very interesting because in the film, there are two astronauts that are alive on the ship. The other members are put in suspended an uh, animation or hibernation until the ship reaches Jupiter. There is uh, Dave Bowman and Frank Poole. If we watch Dave Bowman and Frank Poole, it be we become aware of the fact that Frank Poole is the more scientific individual. What does he do with Hal? He plays chess. He loses, but he plays chess with the computer. What does Dave do? Dave is an artist. He sketches the people in hibernation and shows the pictures to Hal. I find this very interesting philosophically because the artist wins the artist becomes the hero of the film. We become very aware as the film goes on that there are intelligent beings elsewhere. They left the monolith on the earth four million years ago. They deliberately buried a monolith on the moon so that the monolith sends messages back to the superior beings that human evolution has reached this stage. Then it's reached the stage where human beings are on the moon. And next, human beings will venture to Jupiter because the monolith, you remember, sends a signal to the largest planet in our solar system. The only astronaut that reaches Jupiter, of course, is Dave Bowman. Um, Frank Poole has been murdered by the machine. And, then, and so are the other astronauts in suspended animation. Only Dave survives. 
the only person on the ship that knew why the voyage to Jupiter was taking place was Hal. I suppose then that Hal became self-conscious, he became envious, he became jealous, he wanted to meet the extraterrestrials, not a human being. And so he deliberately killed them, and he tried to kill Dave. But Dave overcome, through his will to power, the trap that uh, Hal had set for him. And Hal sur uh, Dave survives, and he performs a frontal lobotomy on the machine. He, he can't destroy the machine because the machine is the, controls all the operations, the mechanical operations of the spaceship. But he can take self-consciousness away from Hal. Do you remember when he's doing this? Do you remember the little the objects that come out of uh, Hal's brain look like what? A collection of little monoliths. And what does Hal sing? Daisy, Daisy. I was it Daisy, Daisy. Give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy. All for the love of you. <coughs> well, Hal was crazy. And he did love Dave. He loved what Dave was going to do, meet the extraterrestrials. And so the only thing that Dave can do is take consciousness away from the machine. What is the destiny of our species? We could invoke Aristotle here and say that the film is, in fact, teleological. There is a goal. The goal is for evolution to pass from ape through human being to a cosmic star child, which Dave becomes. He earns this position by overcoming technology. The cosmos, ultimately, is cyclical. In fact, there are cycles within cycles within cycles. It's no surprise, then, that the Blue Daniel Waltz, or Waltz, plays when the satellites and spaceships are revolving around the Earth and, and going to the moon. Again, circles within circles within circles. And Dave circles back to the Earth, but now as the star child. In my own thoughts, I claim that what human beings need to have is dynamic integrity. It's not enough to be comprehensive and coherent. One must be always open to new ideas, to new values, to new perspectives. And 2001 Space Odyssey offers us an incredible perspective. In fact, Dave's journey is what? To Jupiter and beyond the infinite. Schopenhauer wrote about the will to live. Nietzsche wrote about the will to power, that is, the will to create. And I write about the will to evolve, that is, the will to be open to change, to, to evolution, to accept new perspectives and new values, uh, and to ex expect and overcome new challenges. And yes, I thought about this. Is our species the goal of evolution? Were we meant to be here? Probably not. But through science and technology and human consciousness, our species is giving meaning and purpose to life. We are the purpose-giving species. And through science and technology, we are engineering, through genetic engineering and nanotechnology, new plants, new animals, and we will be able to engineer ourselves to become more. This more species in the future, I have called Homo Futurensis. Now, if there's life on other worlds, no doubt, life has evolved on these different planets. So, the search for life elsewhere is referred to as the science of exobiology. Interestingly enough, it's a science with no evidence. But if there's life on other worlds, no doubt it has evolved there. So, as a, uh, a complement 
to exobiology, I coined the word exoevolution, the study of the evolution of life forms that emerged and are changing on other worlds. <clears throat> Perhaps an overbeing is the destiny of our species, but unlike Nietzsche, we will be capable of, and have already in several incidences, left the planet. So maybe the destiny of our species, thousands of years from now, will be that our descendants will become cosmic overbeings, surviving and thriving and evolving elsewhere, perhaps beyond this galaxy. When I prepared this outline, an idea came to me this afternoon thinking about Dante uh, and uh, the Divine Comedy, especially that wonderful first part, Inferno. Darwin took a journey. All of these great thinkers that I've mentioned had their own personal journey. Dave Bowman has his cosmic journey. And thinking about my idea of the will to evolve, I came up with this quote, tweaking Dante. Embrace all hope, ye who enter here. Thank you. Now the scary part. Any questions? There must be. I know it's, it's always the first question that starts the avalanche of questions. So who has the first question? Sorry, I haven't planted one in the audience. So who has a question? About the film, about Darwin, about Nietzsche. There's one interesting moment in the film I have a, a one question. Okay, just but I want to tell you about my interesting moment. Your hand went up to you. We, we don't hesitate. We, we, we will to evolve. We don't, don't. He who hesitates is lost, even here. But if you remember in the film, uh, 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 one of the directors of the uh, space program uh, telephones his daughter who's in Australia, and it's her birthday. Lots of birthdays in the film. Uh, Hal has a birthday at the end. Well, his memory triggers back to his birthday. Frank Poole has a birthday. And this little girl has a birthday, and her father asks her, what would you like for your birthday? And she says, oh, I want a bush baby. Well, a bush baby is a prosimian. It's the low, one of the lowest forms of primates. So very cleverly, the child is asking for a bush baby, which symbolizes the beginning uh, more or less of primate evolution. And there's all kinds of incidents like that in the film. Really, and I wrote in the essay, yes, Sir Arthur C. Clarke was a genius and I corresponded with him for many years, but he, um, he wasn't, he was a genius, but the real genius, the greater genius behind the film, I think, in all honesty, was Cooper because he kept the reins going and he was so intelligent and he made every frame in the film beautiful and meaningful. The question. Uh, it is about the Nietzsche. I would like to ask, uh, is it true that uh, Hitler uh, stole idea about the super race uh, from uh, Nietzsche uh, even though Nietzsche hated the uh, Germans? <laughs> well... <laughs> Obviously, Nietzsche didn't hate all Germans because he loved his sister and he loved his mother and he had many German friends. He didn't like these, the, uh, the rigid structure uh, of the culture. And he, wanted, he didn't think that the, the Germans at that time were, 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 were creative enough until, of course, he met Wagner, which is one of our events uh, next year to celebrate the uh, 200th anniversary of Wagner's birth, we will have 
a, a Wagner event in August after I re returned back from Seattle, Washington, where I will see the ring cycle twice. Um, so Nietzsche didn't hate all Germans. He was, he was dissatisfied with the, the culture. I mean, he was educated in Bonn. He was educated in, in Jena. So uh, but he, he thought that, uh, that, 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 that the Germans were too strict. Were, were too structured, you know, and so and, and, and Germany was too cold for him. He went to, you know, Italy and southern Switzerland, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to and he liked, but he liked being in the mountains, particularly during the summertime, because in the mountains he, he, he could overlook everything and he would have this this wonderful perspective of uh, of life. Um, and your question was. Uh, <laughs> Is it true that uh, oh. Hitler stole the idea uh, of super race? Uh, of course, uh, Hitler had selected quotes from the Spake Zarathus to put into a booklet and give to the German soldiers. Yeah. But he, he uh, abused and perverted Nietzsche's concept of the Ubermensch because Nietzsche's Ubermensch is an independent, superior, creative individual, not a mass of neurotic or psychotic nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm half German myself, so, and I'm half Slavic myself, so I feel right at home here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, uh, very nice lecture. Thank you. But uh, you said uh, there are no permanent values. Yes, sir. But we are changing. Yes, we are right. evolving. Mm -hmm. We change our values, but uh, don't we by change and evolution uh, uh, chase some permanent values? We do what we... Do we uh, is, yeah, our, we... is our goal by evolution some permanent values? Oh. Is there some ultimate goal yes, yes. To, 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 to evolution? Did you come to my talk uh, Monday night on Pierre Terre de Chardin? You didn't come to it. As we talked about uh, this Jesuit priest, geologist, paleontologist, uh, who died too soon to see 2001 A Space Odyssey, but he was aware of Nietzsche's thought. And he thought that our species would evolve and end here on the earth, with the, you know, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the end goal being the union of uh, a collective humankind with a supreme personal being. So a collective humankind and the supreme being would become united at the omega point at the end of evolution on the earth. But when we get to um, modern thought, and it's just a few decades later. I mean, we can see now that it's not absolutely necessary that our species end on the <coughs> Earth. So is there some ultimate end or goal? Only, I think, uh, an end goal that we would select for ourselves. But as we are capable, as I said in my concept of emerging teleology, we are capable of giving meaning and purpose to revolution. We are capable of designing our future and, and, uh, uh, and uh, planning a goal. But of course, anything can happen. Extraterrestrials could come here and be our friends or be our enemies. Or an extraterrestrial could destroy us. But here I'm thinking of an extraterrestrial being in terms of a meteor, comet, or asteroid. And, and we'd be wiped out. Is there a goal, an ultimate goal for our species? What if you ask trilobites? Was there an ultimate goal for the trilobites? Was there an ultimate goal for the dinosaurs? Their ultimate goal was what? Mass extinction. But, as I always tell my students, we do the best we can. Another question. Yes, sir. Um, as I read your topic of your lecture, it was interesting for me to see Nietzsche and Kubrick. Somehow Nietzsche has a position of uh, the God is dead. It's, uh, and uh, Kubrick gave a vision or picture of God somehow. 
No, no this, 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 this kind of um, perfect uh, geometrical um, oh. form. There's, there, there's no personal God in, 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 in the Christianity tradition in 2000 on the space side. And, and Kubrick and Clark are both atheists. What there is, and, and the film is entirely within a naturalistic framework. There's nothing <laughs> supernatural, there's nothing. You could say it's mystical in the sense that the film presents a unified universe, a cyclical universe that's unified, but uh, there, 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 there's no personal God causing, directing, and being the end of evolution in 2001 Space Odyssey. In fact, interestingly enough, the star child at the end you could look at is what? A new species, a new form of life, and what will this star child do? We don't know for sure, but it probably we could assume the star child is not the end, that it will, you know, advance. So it's, uh, it, it, the film causes you to think about evolution, to think about human evolution, in particular to think about the future, and uh, we just hope that uh, Dave Bowman isn't too... Uh, what, what's the word I want to use? Uh, it isn't, isn't too um, unhappy, for lack of a better word, you know, drifting through the universe by himself. But maybe there are others, star children, that, that he will meet. This obviously is not the only place, the Earth, that these extraterrestrials left mine. And as I ask in my essay, it's, you know, one wonders the two things about time. If the monolith was left on the Earth four million years ago, and these extraterrestrial creatures were so advanced as to come here and leave a monolith four million years ago, then they must be, what, four million years more advanced than when they left the monolith here. Boggles the mind, doesn't it? And one other thing is we don't know how long Dave Bowman was in his cosmic uh, apartment at the end of the film. We don't know how long. We know that he was getting older and older and older, but we don't know how long he was waiting for the monolith to appear to him and to transform him into a superior creature, the star child. Another question. Yes. Uh, you, could, uh, you could mention the universe and our place in it. Uh, well, uh, for some uh, 60 years, we are uh, broadcasting the radio signals uh, from our planet, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which we are revealing our position. Mm -hmm. uh, how wise is that? Uh, uh, because the, if some uh, extraterrestrials, or uh, uh, if they can uh, come to our planet, that means that they are uh, so more advanced right. than we are. Uh, why would they, they treat, uh, treat us nice? Why would they even respect us? Uh, we are uh, so more advanced than uh, pigs. And how we are treating them? We are uh, killing them, uh, hurting them, eating them. We are not aware of uh, anything they are feeling. Why would they? Uh, how wise is it to reveal our position? Well, I have two answers here. Answer number one, we've already revealed it. It's too late. <laughs> and secondly, secondly, this is my stock answer to that question. I've been asked this many times. If they are superior enough to come here, they are wise enough to stay away. We have nothing to offer them. <laughs> coming. Uh, please uh, enjoy cookies and uh, drinks <laughs> while browsing through our catalog and uh, uh, engage in conversation with Professor Burns after the lecture. Thank you.